In English, there are many situations where we need to refer to ourselves. I am hungry. This teleportation device belongs to me. I don't know who I craved mustard. I digress. So by using the words like I, me, and this, we're able to refer to ourselves pretty easily. In JavaScript, things aren't that much different. We will be writing or running into some code where we need to refer to the current object or the current context in a very general way. And the way we do that is by using this keyword known as this, just like the English version of the word this. And the reason for this is because our code runs in a variety of contexts. You could run localized fully inside a particular function. It could run globally at the window scopes. So whatever you write runs at the window layer, so everything inherits it. Our code could also be constrained to the insides of a particular object or a class or object definition. There are a variety of contexts and the easiest way to know what context our code is running in is by using the this keyword. It always exists. It's like our friend that always points to where our code currently is running in. So here's an example. Let's say you're in the window and you type in console.log and then you check out what the value of this is going to be. In most browser contexts, it's going to be window. In non-browser contexts, you might see global or another version of it. But at a, you know, let's talk about the browser for now. You get the window object and all the various things that go inside of it because that's what this is running in, especially when I do it in this format. Now, if I'm inside an object, let's say I have an object called my object whose property has a function value in it. When I do a console.log and do it this value, you can see that the context that this is being referenced in this particular situation is the object itself, the my object object. And if we didn't have this, you know, let's imagine a world where this does not exist, we have a property called Iron Man inside our object again called my object. We have another property called what is this? It's a function. And inside of it, we're logging the value of name. In an ideal world, you might think that, okay, I have an object, it's a property called name, it's pointing to Iron Man. So if I try to print this out, I will get Iron Man. But you don't get that. It doesn't work that way. And the only way to get the value correctly inside an object is by using the this keyword. So you can see by just calling it by this dot name, the right value gets printed out. Everything is good. Life goes on happily. And to go one step further, you can see the word or the keyword this being used, especially with class definitions, in this case where we have an object called fruit that we're defining, has two properties, constructor and get name, or more properly, has methods. And within that, we use the this keyword to be able to both store the value of name we're passing in and reference it later as part of the get name method. And you can see how when we define our apple object and our orange object, both of type fruit, they get the right value when we are printing out the value from get name. Another example of this playing a critical role in getting at the right value that we need. Now, that's all good, that's a happy path. What I'm gonna talk about next are some situations or one situation where you'll run into quite frequently, especially when working with functions and nested functions and all kinds of you know, related siblings of that, where what the value of this should be and what it actually is don't quite match up. So here's an example. We have an object called counter, it has two properties with numerical values, initial with a value of 100, interval with a value of 1000. And then we have a start counting method, and it's a property. And what this property really specifies is that when we call start counting, we want the value of initial to increment by one each time this that interval, based on the rate of this that interval. So in the values we have right now, Initial is going to be 100, it's going to be 101, 102, 103, every 1,000 milliseconds or one second. That's the idea. And when we look at this code, it seems like it should match up. You know, everything seems to be on the up and up, but the reality is that's not what we see here. What you're going to see is NAN, not a number. When this dot initial that we see right here gets printed to the screen, the console, what's going to display is not 100, 101, 102, or anything even remotely resembling that, it's going to display NAN, not a number. And the reason for it is this. When we declare functions, at the moment it's being created, it has the context that it needs to be running in. So when we create counter.startCounting, the start counting object gets a function, and it's this within this context is pointing to object, which is a counter object. Now, this function right here, which is inside an interval, does not get created until this particular function decides to do its thing, which is at the 1000 
millisecond mark or one second mark. And the thing about functions is when they're created, they redefine the value of this as part of their operation. So when they're created with everything else, the value of this is initialized to be whatever context it's running in. When it's created without that kind of a context, without that tie into the rest of the code, it defaults in this case to window. Window is what this is pointing to. So when we're doing this dot initial, it's not looking for the initial property inside our object. It's looking for the value of initial inside window. And since we did not define window initial inside a built-in property, that value turns out to be not a number. Just like before, it doesn't resolve itself correctly. Now, how do we work around this? There are three ways we can fix this. One approach, which is more the historical legacy approach, is we redefine the value of this and use the redefine value in situation where this gets refined. I mean, if the function is looking for a property called this and setting it to a new value, let's give let let it do its thing, but let's just store the value of this somewhere else and use the stored value here. Essentially, what we're doing, and we'll look at the example, it'll make more sense. The second approach is we use an arrow function, which doesn't have this behavior where this is redefined. The arrow functions are different from regular functions in that sense, where they instead inherit the value of this from its lexical scope, from the outer container that it's currently in. And the last approach, just a more advanced approach, but also equally powerful and, and useful, is we use the bind method to redefine the value of this that the function receives. You know, I'm going to show some visuals later on, but imagine you have your function, you wrap it in this gigantic bubble, and that bubble helps redefine what the value of this is. So any code inside of it that references this gets the value from that bubble itself. So we'll take a look at it more. You know, it makes sense visually in my head. It may not based on how poorly I might have explained it right now. So we'll look at it in greater detail. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump to the code editor because I think that's the easiest way to take a look at it. So here's our code right now. It's the exact same code we saw earlier. There's nothing special going on here. I just have a blank HTML document. I have a script tag with our initial counter. And then you can see that same page being displayed here. So if I refresh this page, the timer kicks in and you can see the values that are currently going through. So the first approach we're going to look at is redefining the value of this. So we know that inside start counting, this particular function here, the value of this is object. How do we know this? Let's go and just type in console.log and just do this. And so when I refresh this page, you're gonna see the, you know, not a number from this interval going through, but the first value is initial interval and, and start counting the function. So it's pointing to the counter object. And we know from right here, let me just go ahead and replace the initial for a moment, just, just to bear with me here. When I refresh this page, you can see here where the window is being printed over and over and over again. That goes back to the visual we saw earlier, where this here is pointing to window, and that this in the context of directly under start counting is pointing to the object itself. So our solution here is gonna be simple. We're gonna let that equal this. So what I'm doing is storing the value of this inside a variable called that. Yeah, no, I know the naming is not the best, but bear with me here on that one. And so I'm gonna now replace where it says this dot initial to that dot initial and console.log that dot initial. And so if I refresh the page now, notice we're seeing. You're seeing 101, 102, 103, 104 properly being printed out because the value of this within this function is still point to window, but we're no longer referencing the value of this. We are representing the value of this that is stored by that. And if that seems like a kind of a confusing terminology or word to use here, you can be any variable, you know, but historically, and it's just a matter of practice, that is what we use to redefine this. We can call it something like bacon and eggs, and you know, make sure that, that is appropriately replaced here. And if you refresh the page, you'll now see the value still updating correctly. And you may be wondering why this part of set interval is using this instead of bacon and eggs. Well, the function itself begins and ends right here. All of this code is back in the context of the start counting property, start counting function. So it has the right value of this automatically assigned. So that's the approach of approach number one of redefining the value of this to something that doesn't get changed by whatever function we're dealing with. And so the next approach is the arrow functions approach. And this is the one where, you know, we've seen arrow functions before. They're great for being able to have us reduce keystrokes when defining functions that return a value. 
And so let me go back and just put back to console.log and this, just to get back to your earlier state. If I refresh the page, it's not a number, great. And so to turn this function into an arrow function, it's pretty straightforward in that I just remove the function keyword, add the fat arrow syntax, and that's essentially it. You know, it's a multi-line, multi-statement method. So I use the, the angle curly brackets to refresh the page. You can see 101, 102, 103, doing its thing. And the reason for that is the arrow function, to echo what I mentioned earlier, does not redefine the value of this like a traditional function would. It instead inherits it from its, you know, what we call lexical scope, from where it's defined in code, what is the outer container that it is currently running in, in which case it is start counting. So it just inherits whatever the value of this from this outer, outer scope is and uses that. So pretty straightforward and arrow functions for the win actually, that it, that's all it took to make it work. The last approach we'll look at is the bind method. And for this one, I'm gonna give a little bit of extra material. And so with bind, there are two things we need to use the bind method. One is you need a function. It could be any function, it could be a regular function, it could be anonymous function, it could be whatever. And then you have the bind keyword, the bind method itself. And think of the bind as just a, you know, a gigantic bubble, a gigantic lasso, whatever you wanna call it to just envelop something. And then when you, the way you use bind is you call bind on whatever function that you want to redefine the value of this on. And what happens when you call bind on it is that the function is now called a bound function or also known as an exotic function. So you have exotic cars, but now you also have exotic functions. And uh, the bound function is this value of this is not something we fully specify. It's almost like a brain slug that kind of like attaches to your, to your skull, like you know, what Futurama or any other sci-fi show like that. And whatever it says is what we do. Similarly, you can imagine the, the value of bind as just being that brain slug that kind of tells the function what needs to be done. And let's go back to our code editor and exactly look at what it, how it happens. And so we know that we have the bind needs to modify this area, but let me first let's undo this and go back to function refresh to make sure that everything is still not number. Okay, we're back to a working state. And so the function you want to bind is this one right here. And so this happens to be a function we just defined directly. You know, it could be a name function, but for now we'll just keep it simple. It's a function is defined right here. And we type in dot bind. And here I get to specify the value of this that I want to pass in. But you know, because this is running in the context of start counting, the value of this that we want it's a value of this that will automatically be defined by start counting here. And so all I did was do dot bind and this. Now what we have though, as a result of this, is the bound function or exotic function. I refresh the page, you can now see 101, 102, 103 being printed correctly. I know that it seems a little confusing to see all these this keywords there. So just like before, I'm gonna let that equals this and then just do bind and just put that just to, just to highlight that this is the value that's being passed in you can see that it is still the same thing. But the nice thing with bind is that we don't have to do that. We can just keep it pretty clean and do this work. Now, and let's refresh the page and everything should still, should still work. And so there you have it. We looked at this and the importance it plays in JavaScript, but more importantly, we also saw the three ways we can use this to kind of make sense of situations where the value of this does not always match what we think it should be as part of our code running. We saw three approaches, redefining this. We then saw the error functions approach and we saw an approach using the bind method. Which approach you use is entirely up to you. I My personal preference is error functions because it's cleaner, doesn't require any extra magic the bind method is the more modern one, is the one you might see used in a lot of popular frameworks and libraries, but even they are switching to the arrow functions approach. So if you don't have a preference, if your team doesn't have a preference on how you deal with this, use the arrow functions. You can't go wrong with them. And they you it is save a few keystrokes as well, which is always a good thing. And with that, if you have any questions, post in the forums at formatgroup.com where I and others would be very happy to help you out. Next steps, tell your friends and enemies all about it if you liked this video or if you didn't like this video, hit subscribe to be notified of new videos that we'll be making around similar front-end topics. Follow me at Karupa on Twitter, on YouTube, on Facebook, wherever my name tends to be representing web development content. There are other Karupas out there. I'm sure they're wonderful people, but 
You probably want to follow me though, but for this kind of stuff. Lastly, if you like reading content on web development in a visual, casual, friendly manner, definitely check out my books. They exist in paperback and Kindle editions. And I might be biased, but I think they're pretty cool. And with that, I will see you all next time.